June 7th, 1971, Silver Spring, Maryland. Ken Ballou is standing buck naked in his apartment hallway, pointing an 1847 Colt Walker revolver at ATF agents who have just broken down his door. Moments earlier, he'd apparently been enjoying a bath with a woman named Sarah Louise McNeil, and now he was ready to defend them both from what he assumed were burglars. The ATF agents, on the other hand, who are acting on a tip that Ballou is in possession of illegal weapons, are now staring down the barrel of that 1847 Colt Walker. They open fire on Ballou, eventually hitting him in the head, but not killing him. After the scene is secured, they find a large quantity of legally owned firearms, as well as gunpowder, fuses, primers, and several inert grenades, all of which are legal to own. But when Ballou, an Air Force veteran and member of the National Rifle Association, tries to sue the federal government for, uh, shooting him in the head, the judge rules against him, claiming, one, he should have opened up when he heard the battering ram, two, he should not have pointed a weapon at ATF agents, and three, while the grenades were inert, he did have all the parts necessary to weaponize him, so the ATF technically had a right to be there. It was certainly a tough loss for Ballou, but for the NRA, it would become perhaps the most important moment in the organization's history up to that point. Since the late 1960s, with both the passing of the Gun Control Act of 1968 and growing concerns over violent protests in America, a divide had begun to form between NRA members. On one side, you had the current leadership, which was content with its sponsored shooting matches, its outreach to organizations like the Boy Scouts of America, and its various publications. On the other, you have a small group growing more and more concerned about the Second Amendment and regulations that stand in the way of it. After the Blue Case, the NRA created the Institute for Legislative Action in 1975, taking its first big step into life. Lobbying. But even with the ILA, the NRA remained relatively apolitical, staying out of Second Amendment debates and openly supporting the Gun Control Act of 1968. In fact, over the next two years, from 1975 to 1977, the NRA began planning to move its headquarters from DC to Colorado Springs to become primarily a publisher, to lose the ILA, and to even lose the word rifle from its name, the National Rifle Association. And then the revolt at Cincinnati happened. After years of growing unrest, that small pro 2A faction of the NRA decided it was finally time to take a stand. So, at the NRA's 1977 National Convention in Cincinnati, they grabbed some walkie-talkies, donned hunter orange ball caps, and led a coup against the old guard. By the next morning, they were officially in charge, and the NRA became the lobbying superpower it is today. What's your favorite bit of Strange Harland history? Let us know in the comments, and be sure to check out Raider Red's new Snapchat Discover channel. I'm Christopher Pilney.